Welcome back, kindergarten, to part two of chapter 12, Daily Bread, taken from Margaret Gaddy's Parables from Nature. And this time, I have a little Robin Redbreast joining us so that you can see what a Robin Redbreast would look like, what the author was picturing while she re wrote this story. Continuing on with our story. But by and by, as the morning wore away, the frosty feeling and autumnal mists cleared off. And when the sun came out, which it did for three or four hours in the early afternoon, the day became really fine. The old tortoise did not fail to discover the fact and not having yet scratched himself a hole completely to his mind, he came out of the shrubbery and took a turn in the sunshine. This is quite a surprise indeed, said he to himself. It is very pleasant, but I am afraid it will not last. The more's the pity, but however, I shall not go to bed just yet. With these words, he waddled slowly along to the kitchen garden, where he was in the habit of occasionally basking under a brick wall. And now, tilting himself up sideways against it, he passed an hour, much to his satisfaction, in exposing his horny coat to the rays of sun, a feat which he never dared to perform during the heats of summer. Meanwhile, the poor little robin continued his songs in a retired corner of the grounds, where no one objected to his cheerful notes. A tiny grove it was, with a grassy circle in the middle of it, where a pretty fountain played night and day. During the pauses of his music, and especially after the sun came out, he wondered much to himself about all the strange, uncomfortable things the tortoise had said. Oh, to think of his having wanted to go to sleep and be out of the way. And now here was the sunshine making all the grove as warm as spring itself. If he had not been afraid the tortoise might consider him intrusive, he would have gone back and told him how warm and pleasant it was, but absolutely he durst not. Still, he could not, on reflection, shut his eyes to the fact that there were no other songsters in the grove just now besides himself, and he wondered what was the reason. Time was when the nightingale was to be heard every night in this very spot. But, now he came to think of it, that beautiful pipe of his had ceased for months. And where the bird himself was, nobody seemed to know. The robin became thoughtful and perhaps a little uneasy. There was the blackbird, too. What was he about that he was so silent? Was it possible that all the world was really as the tortoise said, thinking it wise to go to sleep and be out of the way? The robin got almost alarmed, so much so that he flew about until he met with a blackbird, whom he might question on the subject. And of him he made the inquiry, why he had left off singing. The blackbird glanced at him in astonishment. Who does sing in the dismal autumn and winter, said he. Really, I know of scarcely any who are bold and thoughtless enough to do so except yourself. The larks may, to be sure, but they lead such strange lives in the sky or in seclusion that they are no rule for anyone else. Your own perver persevering chirruping is, 
in my humble judgment, so out of character with a season in which every wise creature must be apprehensive for the future, that I can only excuse it on the ground of an ignorance and levity, which you have had no opportunity of correcting. It would be kinder to attribute it to a cheerful contentment with whatever comes to pass, cried the robin, ruffling his feathers as he spoke. I rejoice in each day's blessing as it comes, and never wish it for more than it does come. You who are wishing the present to be better than it is, and fearing that the future may be worse, are meanwhile losing all enjoyment of the hour that is now. You think this wise to me, it seems as foolish as it is ungrateful. With these words, the robin flew away as fast as he could, for, to say the truth, he felt conscious of having been a little impertinent in his last remark. He was rather a young bird to be setting other people right, but a robin is always a bold fellow, and has moreover rather a hot temper of his own, though... He is a kind creature at the bottom. He had been insulted, too, there was no doubt. But when people feel themselves in the right, what need is there of ruffling feathers and being saucy? And the robin did honestly feel himself in the right. But, oh, how hard it is to resist the influence of evil suggestions, even when one knows them to be such and turns aside from them. They are so apt to steal back into the heart unawares and undermine the principle that seems so steady before. To a certain extent, this was the case with our poor little friend. And those who are disposed to judge harshly of his weakness must remember that he was very young and could not be expected to go on right always without a mistake. Certainly, certain it is that he drooped a while in spirits as the winter advanced. He sang every day, it is true, and would still have maintained his own opinions against anyone who should have opposed them. But he was decidedly disturbed in mind and thought sadly too much for his own peace and comfort of what both the tortoise and the blackbird had said. The colder the days became, the more he became depressed. Not that there was any cold then that he really cared about, but he was fidgeting about the much greater cold which he had been told was coming. And as he hopped about on the grass round the fountain, picking up worms and food, he was ready to drop a tear out of his bright black eye at the thought of the days when the ground was to be so hard that the worms could not come out or his beak reach them. Had this state of things gone on long, the robin would have begun to wish to go to sleep, like the tortoise, and no more singing would have been heard in the plantation of the suburban villa that year. But robins are brave-hearted little fellows, as well as bold and saucy. And one bright day, our friend bethought himself that he would go and talk the matter over with an old woodlark, whom he had heard frequented a thicket at a considerable distance off. On his way thither, he heard several larks singing high up in the sky over the fields. And by the time he reached the thicket, he was in excellent spirits himself and seemed to have left all his magrims behind. It was fortunate such was the case, for when, as he approached the thicket, he heard the wood woodlark's note, it was so plaintive and low that it would have made 
anybody cry to listen to it. And when the robin congratulated him on his singing, the woodlark did not seem to care much for the compliment, but confided to his new acquaintance that although he thought it right to sing and be thankful as long as there was a bit of comfort left, he was not so happy as he seemed to be, since in reality he was always expecting to die some day of having nothing at all to eat. For, said he, when the snow is on the ground, it is a perfect chance if one finds a morsel of food all day long. But I thought you had lived here several seasons, suggested the robin, who in his braced condition of mind was getting quite reasonable again. So I have, murmured the woodlark, heaving his breast with a touching sigh. Yet you did not die of having nothing to eat last winter, observed the robin. It appears not, ejaculated the woodlark as gravely as possible and with another sigh, whereat the robin actually twinkled with mirth, for his eye actually twinkled with mirth, for he had a good deal of fun in his composition, and could not but smile to himself at the woodlark's solemn way of admitting that he was alive. Nor the winter before, asked he. No, murmured the woodlark again. Nor the winter before that, persisted the saucy robin. Well, no, of course not, answered the woodlark, somewhat impatiently, because I am here, as you see. Then how did you manage when the snow came and there was no food, inquired the robin. I never told you there was actually no food in those other winters, answered the woodlark somewhat peevishly, for he did not want to be disturbed in his views. Little bits of things did accidentally turn up always, but there's no proof that it will ever happen again. It was merely chance. Ah, my venerable friend, cried the robin, have you no confidence in the kind chance that has befriended you so often before? I can never be sure it will do so again, murmured the woodlark despondingly. But when that kind of chance brings you one comfortable day after another, why should you sadden them all by these fears for by and by? It is a weakness, I believe, responded the woodlark. I see what I can do towards enjoying myself more. You are very wise, little robin. And it is a wisdom that will keep you happy all the year round. Here the woodlark rose into the air and performed several circling flights, singing vigorously all the time. The old melancholy pervaded the tone, but that might be mere habit. The song was, at any rate, more earnest and strong. That is better already, cried the robin gaily. And for my part, if I am ever disposed to be dull myself, I shall think of what you told me just now of all the past winters. Namely, that little bits of things did always accidentally turn up. What a comforting fact! To think of my ever having been able to comfort anybody, exclaimed the woodlark. I must try to take comfort myself. Aye, indeed, cried the robin earnestly. It is faithless work to give advice which you will not follow yourself. So saying, the robin trilled out a pleasant farewell and returned to the shrubbery grounds where, in an ivy-covered wall, he had found for himself a snug little winter's home. <laughs>